brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, it was, I think, right after the end of the Second World War, and the Times of London, which was the London Daily Newspaper, they, <clears throat> they decided that they wanted to get some input and some insight into some of the problems that society was dealing with. And so what they did is they sent out a, a letter or an invitation to some of the leading pastors and preachers and theologians of the time, and they asked them a very simple question. What is wrong with the world today? And it was hoped and expected that all these pastors and theologians and preachers would write an essay that would then appear on the, the editorial page. Now, I thought it would be kind of fun to recreate that experiment. And so actually, if you have your sermon outline um, in the bulletin, just pull that out for a minute, and you're going to see a blank line at the top. Now, obviously, um, you are not going to be able to write a whole essay on that line. If you do, I commend you. That's impressive. But maybe think of a word or two, and just jot that down on the line right now. If you need a pencil or a pen, just you know, elbow your neighbor. Or go ahead. Don't be shy. Just, just go ahead. And if, you, if you really can't do it, at least think of something. Okay? If you had to answer that question, what is wrong with, with our world today? What's wrong with society? What would you write down? You can even steal a pencil from the friendship path. Just make sure to put it back. And, uh, and take a minute and do that, just, just to get your mind working on this for a second. <clears throat> I, I suspect, as you're writing, I'll give away some of the answers maybe. I, I suspect that if, if we were to go around the room and get people to, to share and to offer their, um, their, their ideas on this, I, we'd probably get, some of you maybe you wrote down um, the family structure, right? The, the problem that we see so often is that families have broken down. And if we could just somehow restore families and traditional family values, then society would be a whole lot better. And that's actually a, a very I think, good point. I think there's something to that. Some of you maybe took a little bit of a different approach. You said, well, you know what? We've lost, we've lost the sense of, of good, proper, um, biblical morality. Right, if we could just recover not just family values, but traditional morals, traditional principles that used to be so important, if we could just somehow find a way to get back to that, then all of society would be, would be so much better off. We'd be able to fix so many of the ills and the concerns in our world today. And again, I think there's something to that. I think there's something to consider about that and to reflect on. Maybe others of you would look, you take something of a different approach, and you look more like at... at societal structures of racial injustice, economic injustice, and those sorts of problems. And you might say, you know, if we could fix the structures, if we could deal with these injustices in the world, then the world would again be in a much better place. And again, I think there's something to that. I think there's something, you know, there is brokenness in structures and in the, the systems of our society that aren't always helpful and, and good for our, for our society. But you know what? As important as all those things are, and as much of a, a role as they all play, as we listen to the Apostle Paul in our text this morning, as we listen to what he says and how he looks at the, at the problems, Paul wants us to see that, that the issue goes deeper. The concerns run much deeper than just these, these external things. Paul wants us to look at the heart of the issue, literally. He wants us to see that the concern of the human heart and the role that that plays in the brokenness of our world today. Now, quick, maybe a technical note here. It, it, this, is, this is one of these passages in the New Testament that lots of, of theologians and, and smart type people have argued and debated and discussed an awful lot about it. And I'm not going to, I don't want us to get lost in the weeds here, but just so you understand the, the issue here, because I think it, it is relevant to, to the text. This is one of these passages that people have argued about. Did Paul write this before he was converted to Christ or after? Is he describing his experience before he came to know Jesus Christ? Or is he describing his experience as a Christian still wrestling with the problem of sin? Now, I get why people raise that issue. You see, because if you listen to the language here, if you listen to what Paul is saying, he's describing a very intense struggle with sin. He's talking about the way that, that he's a slave to the law of sin, and sin is waging war in his body and in his heart and in his mind, and we say... How can, how can Paul, the apostle, the missionary, one of the greatest theologians of all time, how can he say that he struggled so much with sin? 
And so that's why people say there's no way Paul could have written this after he came to know Christ. They say he must have been describing his experience before he knew Christ. And I get that, and I can appreciate the way that people make that case, but I want you to know that I think the evidence suggests here that Paul is, in fact, describing his life even as a Christian. He's describing that struggle, that even as a Christian, he's describing that struggle we face, that he faced, with the reality of sin in his own life. If you look at what Paul says, listen to how Paul describes the, the reality of sin, and see if this resonates with you. Start, <clears throat> start in verse 17, Paul says this, As it is, no, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Even as a Christian, Paul says, there's this nature, there's this part of the old self that still has power, that still has some influence in our lives. It's not, when you become a Christian, that doesn't mean that automatically all sin is immediately gone from your life. People still wrestle with it and struggle with it. Right? Verse 20, Paul says this, If I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. That's strong language. Paul is saying that that sinful nature, it, it may be, it may have been, our sins may have been forgiven in Christ. We may come to know Christ and we are accepted and loved by God through Christ. But Paul says there's still going to be that war that goes on with sin until the day we die. That war, that inner conflict, that struggle with temptation and weakness and sin that is going to try to pull us away from Christ. Even redeemed Christians even children of God, even you and I, will still struggle with the reality of sin. Now maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, you know, this is overstatement. Paul is, Paul is being dramatic here. Paul is maybe using hyperbole to make the point. He's overstating the reality of sin. It's possible some of us are sitting here thinking, you know what, I'm a, I'm a reasonably decent person, and, and this struggle with sin, it just, it's not something I relate to all that much. And if you were to go out in the, in the world today as a worker, you'd go out to talk to different people and ask them, you know, do you consider yourself, do you, do you really struggle with, with sin? A lot of people would say, well, no, not really. I'm a pretty good person. My life is pretty well together, and I don't commit any of the real heinous sorts of sins. I'm a reasonably decent person. But I wonder what happens when we start to look a little deeper. I wonder what happens when we start to, to pay attention to what's going on in our own hearts. You know, you know they have on, on airplanes, you know they have those black boxes that are actually the bright orange, what we call them black boxes, and they measure all the, the data and all the information that's going on in the plane, all the systems. They literally report millions of pieces of data and information that's stored on there and records the conversations that the, uh, that the pilot and the co-pilot have. It records everything. And I sometimes wonder what would it be like if we could somehow hook one of those up to, to our own heart and to our own mind. And you start to record and we can somehow start to pay attention to, to thoughts that we have that we don't ever verbalize, we don't share them, but thoughts that cross our minds or attitudes that we sometimes have or things that we sometimes catch ourselves reflecting on, temptations that come our way. What would happen if we were to start to record all the hidden things that go on in our own hearts and in our own minds. I don't know about you, but I know for myself, the reality would not be pretty. The reality is there, that, that there is this conflict, there is this, this war between sin, that even as Christians we will face until the day we die. And the question is, what do you do with that? How do you handle that? How do you, how do you respond to that? I don't know about you, but again, I know for myself that my, my gut reaction, my knee-jerk reaction is to find a way to minimize it. We face the truth about ourselves and we want to maybe make excuses. Maybe we blame other people, we blame our genes, we blame society, we blame our upbringing. We find ways of, of rationalizing the things that we've done. We find ways to make excuses. We find ways to hide from the truth about ourselves. 
What happens when your husband or your wife comes to you and says, you know, you've done something that has hurt me? It's easy to make excuses, isn't it? What happens when a friend calls you on the carpet and says, you know, you said something the other day that really was unkind? It's easy to just argue. It's easy to blame them. Well, you didn't understand. You, know, you took it the wrong way. I think we all do that. We all find ways to do that. Say, well, I just am who I am because I was born this way. I can't do anything about it. Find ways to hide and make excuses. Here's the thing. As we grow in Christ and as we grow in our relationship with Him, we find the freedom to acknowledge and to be open about our own brokenness and about our own sin. Right? Can, you, can you identify this struggle with, with sin? Can you identify the war that's going on that Paul describes? Can you resonate with that? When Paul says, for example, in verse 15, I don't understand what I do. What I want to do, I don't do it. But what I hate, I do. Can you acknowledge that? Can you agree that that is true in your own mind and in your own heart? Christian growth begins when we acknowledge the struggle that we have with sin. Christian growth begins as we face the truth about ourselves. And if you recognize this struggle, if, you, if you're honest about it, and if you recognize it and identify for what it is, that's a step in growth. And then the next thing is, well, how do we fix it? How do we, how do we find freedom from that struggle? Now, Again, going back to what you wrote down on the paper at the beginning there, it depends on what you would have written, but that might give you a hint as far as what you think the answer might be. Sometimes you hear it said, you know, we, we need, if, we, if the problem is that we've lost a sense of morality and right and wrong, then, then the answer it follows would be, you know, we just need to get back to, to the Ten Commandments. We need to put the Ten Commandments back in the courts, and we need to put prayer back in the, in the schools. Maybe you've heard that, maybe you've said that before. Um, some people say, you know, we need to, if, if the family is broken, then we need to restore family values. We need to get back to what good traditional family values used to be. And if we could do that, if we could fix that, then our problems would disappear. And actually, I want you to know that the Apostle Paul would agree with you to an extent. He would sit next to you and he would say, you know, there's something true in what you're saying. In fact, if you listen to him... Go into verse 14, starting the first part of verse 14, Paul says that the law is spiritual, and he's talking about the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments, and the, and the, and the moral teachings, and the moral commandments and instructions of particular the Old Testament. Paul is saying the law is spiritual. Going down to verse, verse 15, he says, I don't understand what I do for what I do, I don't want to do, but what I hate, I do. He's affirming again, and, and then even to verse 16, if I do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law is good. I would affirm that. He would say the law is good. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing flawed about God's instructions or his morals or his commands or his teachings. Paul would say, yes, that's good. God gave that for a reason. It's good. It's spiritual. And then in verse 22, he echoes that again. He says, in my inner being, I delight in God's law. He delights in it. It's good. There's nothing wrong with God's law that needs fixing. The law is not the problem. However, there's a sense in which the law isn't the solution either. And Paul says the law is good. It's spiritual. I delight in it. But it's not enough to say we need to just, let's, let's work harder at following the law. Let's, let's get back to the laws and the commands and the teachings. Let's just work a little harder at it. Paul would say, that's not going to fix it. That's not going to solve anything. Because if you take a look at the second part of verse 14, Paul says what? I am unspiritual. The law may be spiritual. The law may be good. The problem, Paul says, is with me. It's the human heart. Go down to verse 23. Where Paul says, I delight in God's law. The law is good, but... There's another law at work in the members of my body that wage war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law. You see, Paul is saying, I delight in God's law. I recognize and acknowledge that it's good. But, says Paul, there's something broken and there's something wrong with me. It's human nature that is flawed. It's human nature that is broken. 
And because sin dwells within us, because sin dwells within us, the law cannot fix us. Because the law can't get to the root of the problem. It can't get to the heart of the problem. So what do you do? If, if you are, maybe, maybe you struggle with, with gossip, for example. What do you do? You know you shouldn't spread around that juicy piece of story that you heard about another coworker. You know that you shouldn't go around telling people what you heard about a friend of a friend. Or maybe you struggle with pride. You, you always feel like you know best and you always have to be right. And you know deep down that that's the wrong attitude. But what do you do? You know that your marriage is struggling right now and you know that it's at least in part because of, because of you. You're not committed to serving and loving your spouse the way you ought to. Well, you don't need me to say, hey, don't gossip. Because you would sit there and you'd say, you're right, I shouldn't gossip. And you don't need me to say, stop being so prideful. Because you would sit there and say, I know that I shouldn't be prideful. And you don't need me to say, love your wife or love your husband, serve your wife, serve your husband, because you'd sit there and say, I know I should do that. The law is good. But we are on the spiritual, at least in the sense that there's that war between sin that goes on. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, listen to what Paul says in verse 24. As he's bringing this, this chapter to a, to a climax, as he's bringing it to a close, he reaches this point in verse 24 where he says, What a wretched man that I am. He's acknowledging the truth head on. He's facing it for all that it is. He says, What a wretched man that I am. He's saying, I'm a broken person. On my own, I'm helpless. On my own, I can't fix this. On my own, there's nothing that I can do to fix my own heart. And I got to thinking about this, and you know, I think it's really difficult for us. I know it is for me to echo Paul's statement there, to echo his exclamation. I might be able to convince myself to say, what a not perfect but not so bad person that I am. Right? I mean, well, I'm not, I don't have it all together, but I'm not so terrible. I don't know about you, but to say what a wretched person that I am, what a, what a person who cannot fix himself, what a person who is hopeless on his own, well, that's a whole other thing altogether. And yet the gospel says that that's where it begins, to acknowledge our weakness, to acknowledge our brokenness, to acknowledge our inability to fix our problem, to acknowledge that it's not enough to say we just need the rules back in place, we just need to put the rules and the commands and the morals in place, and everything will be okay. The fact is, the closer we grow towards God, in fact, the, the, one of the signs we can tell that we are growing in grace is that we're more and more willing to admit our own weakness, our own brokenness, and our own struggles with sin. And I know that you may be sitting there and you're thinking, this, doesn't, this, this sounds so counterintuitive. How, how can it be a sign of spiritual strength to admit that you're spiritually weak? Doesn't sound right, does it? Sounds completely backwards. And yet it's the rhythm of the gospel. In marriage, to be able to say, you know what, you're right, I struggle with this. In, in your personal life, to be able to acknowledge that there's something, there's, a, there's an addiction that I face, there's a sin that I struggle with, and I've tried so long, and I've worked so hard at trying to keep it managed, to keep it under control, and the harder I try, the harder it gets. There's actually something liberating in saying, I can't fix this on my own. And that's what the AA groups understand so beautifully well. What do you have to do to get help? You have to admit that you have a problem. That's the rhythm of the gospel. That's where freedom begins. Do you have that freedom? Do you have that freedom? Now I know that that Something, this, this sounds good and it sounds right, but there's something that still will hold us back. We touched on it a little bit earlier. See, when, when we are faced with our own brokenness and our own sinfulness, there's a part of us that wants to make the excuses or to justify or to hide. We try to find ways to cover it up all on our own, and we know that they never really work in the end. Because all we're doing is we're hiding from the truth. And I think the reason, one of the reasons we do that, one of the reasons that we don't want to acknowledge our brokenness is because there's a part of us that doesn't want to be known. There's a part of us that doesn't want to be exposed for who we really are. Because we fear that we'll be rejected. 
In, in your marriage, if you have a hard time admitting that, that you're wrong, that you aren't perfect, one of the reasons may be that you're afraid that your husband or your wife is going to reject you because of your sin. One of the reasons that we don't like to own up to our mistakes is because we're afraid of what someone else is going to think of us, that they'll think less of us, they'll look down on us. See, and it's for that reason that Jesus' work on the cross is so utterly liberating and so utterly free. It's that reason that the gospel alone gives us the freedom to face our sinfulness in hope and in confidence. See, so we have a Savior that comes to do more than just give us teaching or advice. We have a Savior that does more than just say, hey, here's the rules, just don't forget to follow them. We have a Savior who does much more than that for us. We have a Savior who peers into the very depths of our soul, who knows us even more than we know ourselves. He looks into the very core of our being, and He sees things that, in fact, you and I don't even know are there. He knows our weakness more than we know. And when he knows us to that extent, and when he knows us so utterly, completely, he doesn't reject us. He doesn't turn us away. But he actually says, I'll take it on myself. Give it to me. I'll take your sin. I'll take your struggles. I'll take your weakness, your guilt, your shame. I'll take it all on myself. I won't reject you. I'll take it on me. And he does that even at the cost and the expense of his own life. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he cares about you. That's when, and when you know that, and when you believe that, and when you trust that, the more you trust that, the more free you are to say, yes, I struggle with sin. But I have a Savior who sets me free. I have a Savior who knows me and accepts me. And so when you know that then in your marriage, with your friends at work, with other people, you have the freedom to be honest about your mistakes. You can say with the Apostle Paul, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, back to the, the question we started with, I, I had you put down what is wrong with, with the world today, right? That question that was asked by the Times of London back in the late 40s or early 50s. All these pastors, theologians, teachers, writers, smart people wrote their essays. There was one particular response that stood out. It was written by a man named G.K. Chesterton. And, and I, I have his whole essay memorized, but don't be too amazed. It's pretty short. He responded this way. He said, Dear Sirs, I am. What is wrong with the world? He said, it's me. It's my brokenness. It's my shortcomings. It's my guilt. And he did that in the confidence of one who knew the freedom and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we could say the same thing. The problem of sin cuts very deep. But the liberation from Christ is far greater. You tell you're growing in grace as you have that freedom to acknowledge your sin to other people, to friends, to loved ones before God in freedom. Thanks be to God because he has given us the victory through Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord our God, if we're honest with ourselves, and we do, we admit, and we do confess that, that we're broken people. We think about things that are not pleasing to you. There are attitudes towards others that are not pleasing to you, that are not Christ-like. Lord, with the Apostle Paul, we can affirm that the, that the war and the struggle with sin is still ongoing in our own hearts and in our own minds. Lord, you give us the freedom to face that, to face our weakness, to face our sin and our shame, but you do that and you help us to face that with, with confidence because you, Lord, know us better than we know ourselves. You know things about us that we don't even, we're not even aware of, but you give us freedom by forgiving our sins. Lord, let us, let, let that be confidence, let that be hope, let that be peace that, that gives us freedom to be honest with others, to be honest about who we are and our weaknesses, and yet our strength that comes from Christ. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.